share it afterwards. So, so welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, for coming today. So my name is Fergal Kenny. Uh, I'm the original founder of Digital Irish. We've got a bunch of the other Digital Irish board members uh, on the call with us today. But um, the reason why I'm doing this call today is that my day job is that I run a recruiting firm called Glen Bourne. And I want to give uh, give you a bit of an idea on sort of like how to sort of like improve your job search, especially for those that you know found themselves sort of unemployed in the last uh, in the last little while. So I'll give you just like just a, a quick thirty seconds on on my background. So as I mentioned, uh, I run my own recruiting firm, uh, the company Glen Bourne. The focus is mainly on the sales chain of command. So we deal with senior individual contributors all the way up to chief revenue officers. And, uh, and sales and marketing oriented GMs. Um, so sales is the focus. We've typically, we've done a lot of work around marketing tech, e-commerce tech. Uh, lately we're doing a lot of work around applied machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other sort of like cutting edge technologies to either specific functions or specific industries. Um, and about 20% of the firms we represent are internationally headquartered, a lot out of Israel, the UK, and some out of Ireland as well. Um, so I mentioned I ran, uh, you know, I founded the Digital Irish Group. Um, my work history, I spent 15 years in sales and sales management roles with a variety of venture-backed firms. Um, some good stories around exits, some not so good. Um, and I spent uh, four years in, in very much corporate sales with BT Global Services as well. And I've done some entrepreneurial things. And I, I bring these up just because they're sort of relevant to what I want to talk about. Um, so obviously, Glenbourne is my own thing. Um, I took a wild move to go to set up a user-generated image agency back in 2007 um, without any experience in that space. That was not necessarily a wise move. Um, and, uh, but I've also built two platforms around what I'm going to talk about today, which, one of which is sort of like you know, declaring your job search status. So we did that sort of like four and a half years ahead of, uh, uh, ahead of LinkedIn. It was built on LinkedIn and LinkedIn eventually shut it down because they thought it was competitive. And then another platform called Job Elevation that was all about uh, proactively searching for your own uh, for your own job and workflow around that. Okay, so I just bring that up because that's sort of like relevant to you know to some of the ways I think about recruiting. So this is the agenda that I want to talk about, right? Um, hopefully in somewhat of a logical format. So I'm going to talk about sort of the tools you use to you know to help you with your search. Um, I think it's important to understand recruiter logic and how recruiters work. So I want to show you a little bit behind the curtains there. Um, and, uh, and the point there is more to show you about how you reverse engineer uh, your job search so that you sort of like get on the radar screen of recruiters, both internal and external. Um, I'm going to talk about reactively setting you, yourself up to be found. I mean, there's two, two parts to every job search, right? So uh, how you get yourself found and, and caught in searches, um, and then how you proactively go about it so, so that you're not sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring, um, how you can actually grab, you know, take control of this. And then I'll give you sort of some general tips and some tips specific to, uh, to this sort of uh, environment that we're in. And then we can open up to, to Q&A, and if you're feeling brave and you want to sort of share your, um, your LinkedIn profile for a critique or whatever, maybe we can do a live critique. I promise to be somewhat kind uh, when I when I do that. So um, so these are the tools, right? That uh, I suggest that you uh, that you use. I mean, first of all, obviously you need LinkedIn, but uh, but you should pay for the premium services. There's certain uh, there's certain features that you get with that. I'm going to talk about about some of those in a second, such as insights on the companies and and who's been on your profile that are very useful to use. Um, and with premium accounts, you can also see a wider swath of the database, um, which you may need in terms of making connections. So that's the first one. Um, Indeed is the great aggregator of, uh, of all the jobs out there. So uh, sign, up for, um, sign up for Indeed if you're not already doing it. Set yourself up with alerts, but you can also post your resume there. It's very much a secondary or tertiary source for recruiters to go to, but every now and again, we will use it and it's not a bad place to put, put up your resume. We'll talk about your resume. You can, we can have a whole sort of separate, separate call about that, but I'll give you the high level of what we look for in a 30 second review. And this is sort of a suggestion, these next two points, which is just about um, 
maybe slightly cleverly using or maybe slightly cheekily using Google Forms and Google Sheets to, uh, you know, to set up a questionnaire for recruiters and, and to track your own opportunities. And then finally, as I said before, I want you to reverse engineer how recruiters work. So I'm going to show you some of our thought process. Okay. So uh, this is the resume advice, right? Uh, what recruiters will look, look for when we look at your resume, right? And generally, you know, we'll give it a 30 second scan just to make sure it's in our zone first before we go deep on it, right? So the first thing is, is the function. And it's, it's really important to be functionally consistent, right? And to clearly articulate your function. There's a lot of people who, uh, who work for firms that give them um, funky job titles and uh, that aren't necessarily descriptive of what they do. So if that's the case, I would advise you to, to change your job title to match your function, um, or at least clarify what your function is. Um, a lot of people sort of will show me resumes that sort of like cover the bases, right? They think that they're being clever, they're setting up a sort of like a wider net by covering the bases and having multiple functions. But I can just assure you that when you do that, you become more instantly forgettable when the time is right. Um, so. Uh, explicitly don't try and be a jack of all trades, try and hone in on a specific function. So the functional match and consistently, the consistency is, is crucial, right? So seniority, sometimes people put up a title and assume that it, it, it gives across the, uh, the meaning that they are actually in management, but it's important to show the scope of the management and to clarify you know, how many people you're managing, what types of people that you're managing. Generally, when recruiters look at your background, we're looking for people who can do the, the job to hand at least at the same level, or they can get there at a stretch. And we're generally a little hesitant of going after people more senior than that role because it adds friction to the process, right? So if you do want to sort of like, uh, if you're in a, uh, a management role and you want to dumb it down and sort of like, uh, and go back to an individual contributor role or a lighter management role, you need to figure out a way to, to specify that. Otherwise, we'll probably skip you. And then when it comes to sort of the company detail, what we're trying to get um, in a quick overview is what does your company do, right? So what industries do you know, right? So in the marketing tech space, do you know social, right? Do you know um, e-commerce tech, do you know ad tech, right? Specific areas of those, we get quite granular, right? So um, if you work for a big division or a company, you work for a company that's been acquired by like a Salesforce and Adobe and Oracle, um, you know, clarify what, uh, what subsets within those companies you're working for because, uh, and even sometimes the, the legacy companies that were acquired, because we look at legacy companies to highlight specific industry, industry knowledge. Okay. Um, so that's why I say sort of like, uh, show the acquisition, show the name changes, show the path, right? Um, and if you're within a bigger firm, really clarify the division that you're in and what they do. Okay. Um, the other key, at least in sales, is vertical match, right? But it, it applies to product, it applies to, to, uh, to marketing as well, right? By vertical, I mean like who, who your company actually sells to. Is it a consumer play? Are they selling to retailers? Are they selling to broader enterprises? And it even can be sort of like a functional vertical. Um, is the focus on HR, uh, chief revenue officer chain, or, um, you know, or equivalent, right? So... Um, so we're looking for that. And then finally, we're looking for bullets that highlight your performance, right? So um, a lot of people tend to do sort of like um, um, very task-oriented resumes. They tell you what they do, but they don't tell you how they, how they did and how they performed. So try and make it sort of like performance-oriented when you have bullets. A couple of task-oriented bullets are fine with each company, but highlight performance and, and, uh, and use sort of like... Uh, use power words to say transformed or grew and, or equivalent. I've got a whole blog on some words that you can use um, to do that, okay? And then the final thing, and this is, uh, this is uh, certainly a, a big thing for recruiters, is about tenure. So we, we'll look at a resume and we'll look at, if we see something like a year, a year, a year in a row, that's a massive red flag. Uh, so just be careful in how you structure your resume. And again, also in your LinkedIn profile, if you're trying to show different jobs within the same company, just make sure that optically it doesn't look like 
short stints, right? Because the way you, you, you present your resume, because you maybe skipped over if that's the case. And the reason why we skip you over is because ultimately we're going to face resistance from our clients when we present someone with short tenures. And for some people who have a, you know, a serial history of short tenures, sometimes through no fault of their own, um, they will set up a sort of like a consulting umbrella and they'll put multiple short stints under that, right? So it's a good thing to do sort of optically. Most recruiters are wise to what you're doing on that, but, uh, but sometimes the optics matter and it's actually a, a, a clever way to go. So this is, um, this is a suggestion, right, um, about dealing with all the unstructured data that you get from recruiters, right? I might skip out of the, um, the presentation for a second. Um, so the idea here is here is that you use Google Forms. Um, and when you get an outreach from a recruiter, rather than dealing with unstructured data, you send them a link to a Google Form, which gets them to sort of like clarify what they're approaching you on, okay? Um, and more importantly, clarify the logic around why they're approaching you. And this gets rid of the spray and pray type of recruiters who are just trying to you know, see what sticks out there. So the end result of this, and this can work when you're like searching or when you're not searching, is that you get to see the responses. You'll have a neat spreadsheet at the end of a year with a whole pile of recruiters, a whole pile of companies, and, uh, and you'll see which ones are, um, have approached you with solid logic. So. Um, that's just a suggestion. Um, when I send this, uh, this presentation afterwards, um, you'll see a form or you'll see a sort of a link, uh, a live link to that, um, uh, to that form and you can copy and, and play around with it. Um, but uh, recruiters that really want to talk to you will go through the effort of actually filling out that form. So again, that's the output. So let's talk a little bit about recruiter logic, right? And obviously I'm talking about the subset of recruiters that actually do apply some, uh, some logic to, to their work, right? Um, again, this is gonna be a little bit biased towards sales, right? But there's a, sort of like a quasi formula that comes into place here, right? Um, and again, I want you, the reason why I'm telling you this is so that when you sort of like think about doing a search, you're reverse engineering how we look at things, right? So, the key variable in it, there's, a, there's about five or six variables in, you know, in any search, right? But the key variables are function and seniority. Um, I talked a little bit about functional, um, you know, keeping functional consistency throughout your resume, but we are looking for that um, first and foremost. It's the most important variable, right? So um, if you're looking to change function, um, that's a bit of a wild move and recruiters just aren't interested in helping you out. You're much better off to rely on friends when you're doing that. The other thing is seniority already, you know, covered the way we sort of like approach that, but we, you know, uh, by default, we have to find a functional match. We have to find a seniority match. Now, this is a little bit uh, specific to sales, but it does apply to, you know, to marketing and product as well. Um, so we have to, you know, the first two variables we have to find when it comes to sort of industry, i.e., you know, in sales, what you're selling or, you know, just in general, you know, what the company does that you work for. Um, we are told generally by, by our clients that we need to find someone who's in their industry, like who directly competes with them or is in an adjacent space to their industry, okay? Um, and then we are told if you can find them, we also want people that target the exact same vertical that we do. So it could be retailers, it could be quick serve restaurants, it could be um, airlines, right? So for these two variables, we're generally, the ideal situation is that we find someone who does both, but you can also find either is acceptable, right? So from your perspective, that means that um, if you're in an industry, you can pivot to a, like a slightly different area of the same industry and pivot to a different vertical, or you can use your vertical to pivot to a, to a different industry, okay? But, to, but it's very difficult to change both industry and vertical at the same time. You lose credibility and leverage, okay? The other set of variables, and these are sort of assumed, are location, right? Um, the, uh, I can't see with the, uh, behind, the, uh, behind the tiles here, so let me make them small, smaller. Uh, visa status and, um, and SaaS. Like when I do a search, generally the searches that the companies that we're looking for, um, you know, are all SaaS based. So it's sort of like a given that, you know, people have SaaS experience, right? Um, but it is a big gating factor. 
your visa status, right? Oftentimes that means you're effectively compromised from a job search perspective because you've got restrictions around your visa. So when you have, so we sort of assume you can work and, you know, when we approach you. So if you have visa challenges, you know, I suggest keeping the other variables constant. Don't try and do anything wild. Don't try and change your function, your industry, or your vertical. Try and keep that the same. Similarly, if you're moving from city to city, um, try and keep, um, that's a key variable that you're moving. So try and keep everything else constant. So that's a little bit about the logic that we apply. Okay. So these are the tools that you know we typically use. Most recruiters, I mean, we obviously are using around databases. I'll show you that in a second. But uh, um, so that's the first port of call is around databases. But when we do a cold search, uh, we're typically using LinkedIn. Sometimes we use Indeed. Sometimes the latter is Monster, is sort of like secondary and tertiary sources. But LinkedIn is the key tool. It's very powerful, and we use it. Um, on the inbound side of things, I mean, most of us has uh, most recruiters have. Uh, job boards or we'll post our, our roles on in, Indeed as well, right? Um, but just from a recruiter's perspective, the outbound channel is far more effective. You can be very specific on what you're, uh, uh, on what you're looking for and, um, you know, you're already predefining what you're, who you're re reaching out to. So um, when it comes to inbound, it's so easy to use the apply now function that literally 95% of the inbound ends up being complete crap. So um, if you are using apply now functions or you're sending in randomly to recruiters, just know that, you know, for every 19 resume, for every 19 resume, bad resumes, there's only one good one. So uh, sometimes recruiters don't bother with the inbound pile at all, just because it's too much effort to find that one resume out of the, out of the, the 20. So this is how we sort of like go about a cold search. Well, firstly, like the, um, when it comes to sort of like databases, right? I mean, here's a here's an example of a database, but I can sort of like I'm applying multiple filters here around industries, verticals, level, and location, right? So you can toggle those, and you'll see some sort of like results that will come up here, okay? But um, when it comes to sort of like uh, to doing a cold search, right? Using the example of let's say working for someone like a sprinkler, right, who does social media management. Uh, we generally use ecosystems, right? I mean, so we'll look at every ecosystem out there that's, that's relevant to the space. So something like a sprinkler will appear up here in the social media management area, right? So first things first, we'll look at companies directly in their zone, and then we'll look at related companies that are also SaaS-based that are in and around the same ecosystem. So social analytics, social promotion, social publishing platforms, okay? Um, there's an ecosystem for everything out there, right? Here's one for big data by Matt Turk. There's another one from the Luma Partners Group about e-commerce. Here's one for CB Insights around digital health. So understand the ecosystems that you're in and do the research, right? Here's one around you know, like, uh, the low-code, no-code space, which is an area I'm working in right now. It's a, it's a Forrester Wave or Gartner Magic, Quad, uh, Magic Quadrant. So, um, so use those tools yourself, right? So going back to, um, to applying that to a, um, uh, let me just move this to present mode again. So when we do a cold search, we will firstly look up the ecosystem. So in the event of, let's say we were doing a, a search for a company like Sprinkler, we'll check out the social ecosystem, but maybe the specific rec is to find uh, someone who knows the social space, um, but who also knows how to sell to retailers. So suddenly the e-commerce Lumascape becomes relevant as well. So we come up with basically a list of firms and we create big Boolean strings out of them. They look somewhat like that. Then we come up with a bunch of different titles and we throw them into keywords, right? Um, into a keyword search in the title field within LinkedIn. And this is where your funky titles come into play. If you've got a funky title um, that is a euphemism for sales or equivalent, you may not show up. So that's why it's important to normalize, uh, normalize the, the, you know, your, uh, your titles around the search. And then we'll execute the search, right? And then we prioritize the outreach. And if you want to see what it looks like within LinkedIn, we have recruiters have their own version within LinkedIn. So um, here's the search right? Job titles, locations, companies, 
you can add a toggle here around your graduate graduation right so i want to remove sort of like entry level people people with at least 10 years experience the keywords piece is important here so i may want people who specifically know how to sell to walmart so at least in um uh you know if you if you've got that skill put that in your keywords and you come up with the search right and you get nine candidates four likely to respond zero open to hearing about uh to hearing from uh from recruiters and this is important here because in a search like this we typically go after the low-hanging fruit first the ones that are open to opportunities um and then the people are more likely to respond before we go to the general pool okay So back to this, back to the deck for a second. Hopefully I'm held in your attention. So, and then just, let's just talk about rules of engagement with recruiters because a lot of people don't really fully understand this, right? These are external recruiters I'm talking about, but just remember we work for the client. We don't work for you. So if you expect a recruiter to take your resume and then shop it around everybody, um, they're not going to do that unless, you know, they've got a, you know, a certain relationship with some of their clients or they think you're an absolute rock star, okay? But we typically are focused on our clients' needs first. Um, I say we look for the path of least resistance. That sounds a little lazy, but we're generally given very specific parameters by our, by our clients. So if we know they're going to push back on tenure, we're going to skip you if you've, got, if you've got poor tenure. So you got to find the recruiters that suit your function and your industry right we're typically interested in you specifically for what we're working on that's a fit but also if we know you're generally in our zone and you might be useful to us long term and it's of mutual interest for us to to get in touch okay and this often gets unsaid but because we do work for the client um we do work in their best interest when it comes to negotiation. Oftentimes we'll, we will try and bring two parties close together, but we are sort of like, you know, divulging information to them. And, and most of us do declare that to the candidate, but, um, but do understand that they're not working on your behalf. So sometimes when you're not talking to a recruiter about a specific opportunity, you can have a very open conversation about the market. And that's why it's good to talk to recruiters offline and just sort of understand how you're stacking up comp wise, and, um, and get some career advice and positioning advice from them. And there's generally a couple of different types of recruiters. So retained recruiters are typically for more senior roles. Uh, they charge 50% typically up front, 50% on placement. Contingency, uh, only charge if they successfully place people. Um, a way this has been described to me before, retained recruiters will try and deliberately um, count you out, whereas contingency recruiters try and count you in, okay? Uh, that's not explicitly the case, but, you know, but there's, there's some elements of truth to that. So moving on from recruiters and more to a sort of like reactive search, right? This is all about uh, how you get found, right? Now, the same sort of like points that I made in your, uh, in your resume basically apply here, right? So you follow those same tips, right? And, you know, optics matter and what's above the fold versus below the folds in your LinkedIn profile really matter. But do beef out your profile. Um, pimp it up with keywords. Um, if you know a campaign's marketing, drop it in there. Sometimes if you work for a smaller company, you may want to do guilt by association, which is identify the competitors. And you can do that subtly by saying, you know, was involved in winbacks from, um, you know, bigger competitor A, bigger competitor B, right? So that when people are doing keywords, um, for competitors uh, that you'll actually come up in the search instead of your small company, which may not hit their radar screen. Okay. Um, that's what a typical profile looks like. That's mine. Um, notice in the middle there, it says, it says show recruiters you're open to job opportunities. That's your, the beacon, what I call the beacon, right? Um, I'll show you how to turn that on in a second, but it's pretty important, right? Um, presentation. Yeah, just like, you know, get a background picture, do something interesting in your background. Maybe it's the location that you're in. There's so many bad um, profile pictures. The worst profile picture to have is no profile picture because it shows you just don't, don't understand social and, and, you know, having a physical presence and, and showing yourself out there. 
Um, but a classic is this is this one to the right, which is the sort of the the party animal sort of look and feel where someone else's shoulder is in the uh, is in the picture and they're obviously out having a good time. Um, it is a professional environment, so look the part. Um, you know, and then you know the parent pictures. I mean, there's a time and a place for that, but uh, so it might look cute, but it's probably not appropriate on LinkedIn. Anyway, there's a whole sort of like series of blogs that are out there on on that, but don't be that person, right? That has the uh, the crap uh, the crap or the the no LinkedIn picture. So back to sort of like open to opportunities. If you want to set that up right on LinkedIn, um, click on your profile picture on the top right. Drill down to privacy, um, and then you'll see job seeking preferences and let recruiters show that you're open to opportunities and click that. And the reason why that's important, this is how it looks, by the way. Like this is the version within LinkedIn Recruiter. That's how it looks. Um, it's sort of like below the fold, below the recruiting activity that we've done with you. Um, but more importantly, when you come up in a search, uh, you know, as I said, we'll typically start on the right, which is the people who are open to opportunities. Um, then the people are more likely to respond and then the general pool. So it's sort of like it gets you, it gets you prioritized in the mix, right? So definitely, definitely use that. And you'd be surprised about how many people still aren't using that. And this is the sort of the, uh, the proactive side. I mean, I represent a lot of like salespeople and it always sort of like, you know, interests me that they spend their days hunting for clients. And then they, you know, when it comes to their job search, they don't do any hunting whatsoever. Right. And, uh, and you can very much take a proactive approach to your job search. Uh, but the key is applying some of the logic that I gave you before. Right. Um, so if you want to sort of like be successful in a proactive search, just try and, you know, try not to do something wild, like change your function. If you want to do that, you're going to have to rely on friends to do that. Right. Um, so similarly keep, you know, either your industry or your vertical, uh, constant, right? If you do both, it's easier, right? Um, and then if you are moving city or if you've got a visa constraint, try and keep it tighter, right? Because you're going to have, you're going to face the barrier, that friction later on. So, uh, so better to not play around with variables at all. So logic is key. Okay. Secondly, you can sort of like, the reason why I said identify the ecosystems that you're in is because there's an ecosystem out there for everything. So um, identify which ecosystems you're in. Your company might appear in multiple ecosystems if it's sliced and diced or viewed a different, a different way. So they're all sort of like ways in which you can pivot. You can move either to a competitor, to a company around you in the same industry, or you can use your vertical orientation, your knowledge of a client set to pivot on that and change your industry, okay? But, um, but do, the, do the digging, come up with a list of your target firms, Okay, um, and then start the research around who is hiring, right? So out of that list, bring up their careers page, you know, set up alerts on, on Indeed um, and, uh, and start to track who's hiring for the relevant roles, okay? You may also wanna sort of vet the firms as well. This is where LinkedIn comes in handy as well. Um, so if you've got a premium account on LinkedIn, you can look at the insights on the firm, okay? Um, you can see how they're tracking employee-wise. So recently, you know, it'll probably take a little bit to kick in, but you'll be able to see dips that happened in the last, uh, you know, in the last month or so, right, as people change their status, okay? Crunch base, you can check for, uh, for funding. Uh, Glassdoor for red flags. Um, you may also want to look at things like Captera and G2, which are sort of like more user-generated review sites around the technologies if it's a technology firm you're looking at, okay? Now, when it, comes, when it comes to sort of how to apply, again, sort of like hopefully you're going to apply the, you know, the, the logic that I gave you around our attitudes to the inbox, and this applies to internal or external recruiters, right? Um, that we have to go through a lot of crap in order to find a good, a good resume, right? So think twice before you do that, right? A better approach is to again, use LinkedIn, right? So if you identify a target firm, so in this case, I'm looking at Domo, right? Which is sort of like a, a big data firm, right? I can see that I've got uh, a bunch of people, you know, I've got two people who are second degree connections, right? Um, and, uh, and I can see that I've got a bunch of like 83 intermediate connections between this guy, Michael, and myself. So if I see a role on Domo, 
on their website that looks to be a match. And I, I found someone within Domo who looks to be involved in that role. The suggestion here is that you reach out to a trusted intermediary connection. You validate how well they know that person and whether they'd be willing to sort of like make an intro for you and get them to make an intro directly for you. That way you skip the, in, the inbound pile. Now recruiters could also be in the mix there as well, right? And over time you may see multiple recruiters looking, you know, who sit between you and the jobs in question, right? Or the people in question. And they're probably the recruiters that you may want to hone in on. So in terms of identifying recruiters, you can obviously find them on LinkedIn. Um, you know, and my suggestion again, using Google Forms, using Google Sheets, over time, if you're doing that when you're not, when you're not looking and you're sending people to the forms, you're gonna have a repository of the good ones who've got good logic, okay? And these are some of the tools that are out there. And this is another reason to have sort of like a premium version of, uh, of LinkedIn. I call it breadcrumbs, but it's like, you know, who's viewed your profile. If I go to sort of like my LinkedIn profile here, um, if I go into my notifications, right, it'll show me people who sort of like uh, looked at my profile. You know, I can't see it now, of course, like now that I bring it up. But, you know, here's an example. I know there's some people on the call who sort of like uh, who were checking me out earlier. Um, but, uh, but the point in doing this is that, you know, you will spot, sometimes as a recruiter, we will look at a profile, but we won't reach out to you. We might hem and haw on it a little bit. But if you take the discipline of looking at who looked at your profile on a weekly basis, you're going to find some people that are relevant to you, um, companies that are relevant to you that actually had a look at you, but maybe didn't reach out. So turn it back on them and reach back out to them and said, I saw you're on my profile. You know, can we talk? It looks like you might have something interesting based on your website. And they'll probably appreciate that, you know, you, you're doing that in a proactive manner. Okay. Um, and I've provided a link to this. I posted this uh, last week, but there's a sort of a, an interesting live, um, this is at least for the tech space, right? Um, but there's a live view on companies that are hiring and who's had layoffs recently um, of a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, companies in this space. So if you want to get the absolute latest on the, on what's going on, you may want to click on that. Again, I'll share this afterwards. Okay. And let me just go back to uh, full screen. Okay. And the final thing is don't, don't discount like general networking. I mean, it's, it's obviously a little harder to do, right? Um, but, uh, but people hire people, right? And it's all about, and you will have a leg up if you've got um, if you've got someone vouching for you on your behalf. So two ways to network, you know, go broad, go to events. I mean, obviously all the events are virtual now. It's a little harder to, you know, to make connections, but you can do that. And we've been playing around with breakout rooms on, the, um, on some of our events and they work to good effect and you can still make good personal connections. Um, but secondly, you know, one-on-ones, I mean, you know, go, you know, hit up your network, hit up the affinity connections that you have, right? Um, sometimes random and strange sort of meetings, they may not look like uh, they're gonna lead to anything immediately, but sometimes if people are good connectors, they can, uh, they can end up being, uh, being very useful. If you are asking, um, you know, a favor of someone, just make sure you're aware of the power dynamic that the onus is on you um, to do the follow-up, to take the notes, to spoon feed them in terms of writing an introduction note. But you know, this is where you need to be crystal clear. If you're meeting someone with one-on-one -on -one -on -one who you think could be helpful to them, be very specific on function, industry, vertical, and even be so bold as to share target firms you're looking at so that they can think on your behalf, right? So dumb it down for them and, uh, and make sure you follow up. And this is the, 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 the final words of, of advice. I'm gonna give you some general tips and then I'm gonna give you a sort of uh, some coronavirus uh, era specific tips, right? Um, you know, the tenacity piece is, uh, is key, right? I mean, especially in, the, in an environment like this where there's lots of competition. Um, I, I indirectly sort of like helped out, help out a bunch of sort of J1 visa people who come over from Ireland for the first time. And, um, 
and they've, they've got a tough situation, a tough visa to deal with it in that it has a sort of like an expiry date. Um, but it's always the more tenacious ones that, uh, that follow up, right? And that actually get the roles that they want, right? So, and as I indicated before, just be aware of the power dynamic. If you're asking of some, something of someone, do the follow up and, and uh, be very diligent with that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the reason why people don't do the proactive element of search is because, you know, they're you know, fundamentally lazy or they want to sit back and, and make things happen for them. But you can actually assert a direction when you do that. But it does take work and just, uh, you know, don't be, uh, don't shy away from the fact that there's going to be a bit of work to, uh, to do in your job search, especially on the proactive side. The logical piece, that's just repeating myself, right? I've showed you the recruiter's logic, reverse engineer, try not to go too wild on what you're doing with your function, industry, or vertical. Keep it in, in the lane, and that way you're more likely to be logical in the recruiter's eyes as someone they should talk to. I mentioned a bit about affinities, but play up affinities, right, for that personal connection. So maybe it's school connections, college connections, diversity, women, LGBT, right? I mean, the Digital Irish Group is all about the Irish affinity connection, at least within the digital space. Uh, maybe there's a sports affinity that, uh, that people have with you, but uh, play them up and make that personal connection. Now, there's two schools of thought on this, right? These are folks with visa issues who might be visa com uh, compromised. They might be on, you know, ha have a J-1 visa, right? Where they're looking for a job um, or they might have an E-1 visa that's tied to a specific, uh, um, you know, a specific company. Um, my personal take on this is you absolutely need to declare that upfront, right? Um, yes, it will count you out a lot of uh, out of a lot of jobs, but the bait and switch on on the visa thing, um, it'll end up wasting wasting a lot of your effort. Um, and that's why, like, if you have a sort of in particular a J one visa, I suggest playing up the you know Irish or expat affinity angle. Um, that way, they're less less concerned about the visa issue when you. Um, you've gotten for a subset of people who care less about the visa issue, right? As opposed to going to a, uh, after broader, broader hiring firms. So speaking of bait and switch, right? Um, there's two areas where I think it's acceptable to bait and switch, right? If you live in the boonies and you're vaguely close to a market, maybe like New York and maybe you're two hours away, you will miss out on massive amounts of activity based on your location. So in order to sort of see the roles that are open to remote, you know, it's okay to declare yourself, let's say living in New York City, even though you may be in Hartford, Connecticut, okay? Recruiters understand that you need to do that. That way, otherwise you're never gonna, uh, you're gonna, never gonna see the roles that end up being open to remote people, okay? The second thing is job search status or, or like job status. If you're unemployed now, um, and you're recently unemployed, um, it generally doesn't make sense to put a, uh, an end date on your most recent role because recruiters are picky on that and they will generally avoid you, especially if you've been out of work for more than three months. Okay, so if you wanna stay in the zone, um, you may wanna say, you know, I worked from there from June of last year to present as opposed to putting an end date on it. But it's important to then switch and uh, when the recruiter reaches out to you and clarify that situation immediately, okay? And then finally, sort of like this came up in one of the questions in advance was just like ageism, right? There's no question that that exists out there. Um, you know, in sales, like, uh, you know, some of it can be, I mean, I, I, I dare I say valid, but like, uh, but sometimes people get later in their careers, they're less interested in cold calling, um, you know, let's say for an individual contributor role. But in order to sort of counteract that, I think there's a couple of things you can do. Number one, you should sort of uh, cut off your um, cut off your uh, your experience beyond 20 years because it's just really not relevant. So when your resume put other experience and summarize everything else without dates, don't put a date around your graduation, right, for college on your resume, and do equivalent things on the, on LinkedIn. Okay. The other thing is to sort of look the part, look with it. Don't dress. Uh, old, I mean, like open neck shirts will, you know, will typically be better than a suit. It depends on the role that you're going for. It's a very sort of like buttoned up corporate sales role. And in the case of sales, you know, suit makes more sense. Um, but if you want to show, your, show yourself as being a bit more dynamic, maybe uh, 
open at least in the form for guys open neck shirts but those those um yeah those are some ways in which to you, you can sort of like combat the you know the, the the potential ageism out there so here's just a you know just a uh, the the maybe the virus specific <laughs> tips right that um in terms of like how to handle this particular market uh, this isn't a very encouraging first point which is to remind you that you've got lots of competition but it really just um but it you know it's more of an encouragement to get out there and be really tenacious right because you've got you got to differentiate over that competition right um i talked a little bit about whether you're out of work um generally it's three months you've got a sort of like a three month window where you're still fresh right at least from a recruiter's perspective beyond that they sort of doubt your ability a little bit more fair or not you know to get roles and I, obviously that's uh you know, this this market is is weird, and there's going to be people out of work for longer than that. No question about it. But um, uh, but all the more reason to work it now while you're still in the quote unquote fresh status. Okay, so um, so don't use this as sort of a sabbatical. I'm going to take it, you know, time off, and oh, it's the summer. Let me take that off as well, um, because I think you'll hurt long term when you do that. So. You may have to get creative in this market, right? Um, you know, the try and buy maybe going in as a contractor to begin with, um, you know, so, so that customer or so that uh, a potential hire can, can, can test you out before, before uh, committing to hiring you full time. So think about that as well. 1099, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's just a tax status around a contractor, right? And for an employer, it means that they, they are basically paying, you know, 20% less. They're not paying health insurance. They're not paying employer taxes, um, and it's much more flexible to to effectively fire you and and get rid of you, right? As opposed to having someone having employee status. Yeah, and just like you know, the tides have turned, right? So employers have the leverage, right? So if they're asking you to jump through hoops, you know, jump through hoops and say thank you for asking me to jump through the hoops, right? If they ask you to do you know, mock sales pitches, and it's a lot of effort. Um, you're going to have to suck it up and do it in this market, unfortunately, right? Um, and the same goes a little bit on the um, on the comp side of things as well. And this is where, like, knowing your market value is important, right? These days in in um, in New York and California, we can't ask people what they're what they're currently making. We have to ask what their comp expectations are, and just make sure that they're grounded in reality, right? I've written a couple of articles that sort of like reverse engineer hiring managers processes at least around around sales roles but now is not the time to go in and assert a number that looks like you're overpaid because they'll find someone else who's able to do the job um you know the same or less right than that than what you're offering so know your market value and uh study it and make sure you're not you're not over overpriced and a recruiter will give you an honest assessment on that and then now might be the time to reskill, right? I mean, so as much as I emphasize like in industry skills, right? Um, you can actually sort of like not fake industry skills, but you can uh, you can do this on the side. You can learn an industry on the side, right? So, for example, a hot area and one area that I'm working on at the moment is the low code or no code space, right? And other areas, robotic process automation. There's a bunch of companies in in those spaces, right? Um, but you can train yourself up on, on those technologies. A lot of those companies offer you a free trial. So if you want to sort of like assert your interest in getting in and maybe pivoting to the RPA space, maybe you put that front and center on your, uh, your resume or LinkedIn profile that you've, uh, you've done a course or you've got certified in Blue Prism or, or one of the other technologies out there. So think about this as a time to sort of like uh, to reskill, but it's also a way to sort of like assert a new industry, right? If you don't have the SaaS sales experience, think about doing a course around, uh, around SaaS sales and some of the nuances and the terminology around that to bridge the gap, right? To help you get from A to B. So let's say if you're in the, the media space and you're working for a publication selling to media agencies, but you want to pivot to technology, a big gating factor will be the fact that you don't have SaaS experience. So see if General Assembly or an equivalent has a course around, uh, around you know, getting up to speed on the terminology and you've shown the interest that you're uh, willing to spend your own time on, on bridging that gap. And then, uh, I'm not going to repeat myself here, but that's the, the market value piece that I talked about. 
And then consistent to what I said earlier about, you know, getting creative, getting creative really applied to working for someone. Um, but, um, you know, think about alternatives of working for yourself, right? Um, you know, maybe in sales, like you don't represent one company, you set up an LLC and you become a manufacturer's rep and you rep multiple firms and you charge them a retainer, right? Um, you know, think about if you've got freelance oriented skills, go on Upwork and, uh, and sign up for work there. And, uh, and I know it's, it's not easy for a lot of people to do, but sometimes this is the best time to, uh, you know, to start a company. Um, uh, you know, when you're sort of like in, in sometimes out of desperation to do it, it obviously costs money to do it, but, um, on the bright side, it's a lot cheaper these days to set up a company and, uh, you know, to build technology and tools than it, than it was five, 10 years ago. So that is sort of like what I, um, wanted to chat to you about. Hopefully that was vaguely useful. Um, I think we're going to open it up to, uh, to questions. So, um, yeah, if, uh, if there's any questions out there, um, unmute yourself and, uh, uh, I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Fergo, quick question. Um, you mentioned um, three months out of a gig is fine. You're still fresh. Um, yeah. This is more question for my girlfriend. She was, you know, thinking of doing some traveling with her sisters and she was concerned about that gap in her CV. Do you think that travel as a young person gets in the way of being fresh on the market? And like for her, could she just put on her CV Oh, well, you know, when traveling for six months with my sisters. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, like, a, you know, sabbatical. I mean, I think it's important to, like, when there's a gap like that, I think it's important to declare what it is, right? Hmm. Um, so, yeah, sabbatical for travel, perfectly acceptable, right? Um, probably a little Great. bit more the norm in Europe than it is in America, right? Um, yeah. Not many people <laughs> do that, right? But, uh, uh, but, yeah, you should absolutely do that. Similarly, if you're, um, you know, if you been taking time off to look after kids or sick, you know, sick family members, you know, right. indicates sabbatical and the reason for it. And I also think it's important to, I didn't, I didn't mention this earlier, but sometimes it's important to sort of uh, indicate why you left a firm, especially if you've got lots of short stints, you may, you may want to indicate that it was a, that it was a riff. I'm starting to see on LinkedIn profiles that uh, lots of people are putting in, you know, or riff related to COVID virus. Right. I see. I see. That makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Has anyone else got a question? Hi, Fergal. Um, I'm wondering, I know you don't know the answer to this either, but I'm wondering, is there any talk about when in-person interviews might start up? Or will it be virtual for the next foreseeable future? I think it's like people are, I mean, I was, uh, I was looking at a, a Morgan Stanley report yesterday that said that you know first wave of people will go back generally the ones that with immunity will go back in June and the next wave is going to be mid July um, I don't see it happening until then so if, if companies are hiring they're going to have to do a remote right so most of my clients have uh, have a significant in-person component um, where they'll fly people to the headquarters you know for a day for final interviews in particular but um, those clients are being forced to do everything remote now and, uh, and make the hiring decision remote. So I don't see it happening for, um, for at least two months. Great. Thank you. Fergal, um, there's a question from Vishal who has a weak internet connection. So maybe I'll just ask it on his behalf. He said, is there any added nuance to your overall, uh, strong advice when it comes to applying for sales manager roles in early stage, say series A or series B startups? Um, especially if there is no openly advertised sales manager role. Yeah, so like with the, with management roles, especially with early stage earlier stage firms, I think it's important to show movement, right? Like in your in your history, what you've taken companies from and to. Oftentimes, um, you know, those firms, especially at the sales leadership level, um, you know, there's very specific requirements we're typically given. We want someone who's taken something from one million to five million, five to twenty. Right. So, um, you know, and has run these diverse teams. So sort of like, you know, show the functional range and show that growth right across the board. Um, but when you talk about sort of like no openly advertised sales manager role, obviously um, there still can be lots of dynamics going on within the company, right? Where the current manager could be on their way out. Right. Um, the only way to cover those bases is to be in, 
you know, at a more senior level, right? So, um, you know, to have a direct connection with the CEO who's ultimately, you know, in charge of sort of placing the, the salesperson. If you want to go above that, it's with the VC who has an idea that they might be firing the salesperson, right? So, or the sales manager. So, um, yeah. So in terms of at least setting yourself up and positioning yourself, it's all about, you know, growth and what I can, you know, what I've been able to take companies from and to. But if there's no advertised roles, um, you know, you need to network in at a, uh, you know, at a senior level as possible um, for the role in, in question, right? So, um, you know, you, if, if you're a regular sales manager, you go after the CRO. If you're a CRO, you go after the CEO or you go after the, you know, a, a VC connection. Um, very good. And um, just can I ask one more question. Um, one thing that wasn't mentioned was the cover letter. So I found that I've, I'm spending more and more time on, um, I suppose, unique cover letters for every company that you do direct apply to. Yeah. Um, how much time do you recommend putting into that and how much does that actually matter in the whole um, recruitment process? Well, a, a good recruiter's job is to create a bio on you that's specific to the, um, you know, to the requirements. So, I mean, at least through recruiters, it's their bio that that really has the weight. And oftentimes we'll ditch a cover letter, right? So like, um, especially generic ones, we'll just put our bio with the um, with the cover letter. If you're applying direct, um, yeah, I think it's like, and and your resume doesn't overtly scream that I should be the person for this job. Um, it is, you know, it's probably a good idea to show the logic there, right? And be, you know, clarify why you think I should be a fit. Um, but I don't have experience as an internal recruiter. So to be quite honest, I'm not sure how they treat them and how much weight they put on them. Um, but I imagine, you know, just because they've got time constraints and they've got that massive inbox, right? They're focused on the resume and, you know, they're, they've got limited time to look through what is largely a pile of, you know, not applicable CVs that they've got in the mail, right? So they're hardly going to focus too much on the cover letter. I think what's what's more like the, the personalized piece ends up being particularly important um, around the follow up and especially in this environment, you know, just the you know the thank you notes and and you know reasserting your relevance after you've gone through various stages of the process. Yeah, thank you. Someone's asking if we're going to be recording this. Um, so the answer is yes. So we'll share it afterwards and I'll share the deck with you afterwards. Hi, Virgil. Just another question. I thought of something I want to confirm. Mm -hmm. If the recruiter doesn't ask you about your visa status, it's better to be forthcoming with them and let them know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because remember, you're going to compromise them. If you don't do that, you're going to compromise them with their, uh, with their clients. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's just, that's just, simply not ethical or not fair to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Hi, Fergal. Um, just wondering about the forms part that you talked about and um, setting up one of these forms. Um, you as a recruiter wouldn't feel put out by someone supplying this kind of... Um... So there's definitely a cheeky component to it, right? You're asking a recruiter to do work, right? But... Yeah. If they really want to talk to you, they will fill it out, right? Because they uh, they will want to add you to the pipeline, right? So, um, listen, it's 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 probably a little bit more applicable um, the more senior you are, right? Where you've got a little bit of that leverage. There's no doubt about that, right? And 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 you do have to remember, sort of like my filter here is that I'm typically dealing with, you know, when it comes to individual contributors, sort of like eight plus years experience all the way up to chief revenue officers, right? So. Um, the more senior you are, the more you can do that. But um, uh, but it's 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 a fair ask, right? I mean, you know, and and I appreciate it when people go, you know, um, yes, you know, push back and ask me to sort of like assert my logic a little bit on why that why I reached out to them. And it's just a good way to get rid of crap recruiters as well. And you did the industry a favor by doing that.
Gavin, were there any questions on that? We had a sort of a, on the spreadsheet that we had earlier. Is there anyone brave enough that wants to show me a LinkedIn profile and I'll have a look at it and, uh, and give you a quick critique or? Go on, I'll paste my one in the chat, so Fergal. Right, all right, so I know a little bit about, very brave Gavin, okay. I know a little bit about Gavin already, right, so. Be brutal. Be brutal. Um, I think we got most of the questions that had been submitted through the form. Um, like we mentioned, we do have Fiona McEntee, who is our um, immigration attorney and sponsor. We'd certainly direct any kind of, there's questions about e-visas and stuff. Um, we would definitely direct you to Fiona. If you want to reach out to us, just send us an email at hello at digitalirish.com. And, uh, you know, if there's any anything uh, more specifically we missed here, we can point you in the right direction. So let's have a look at Gavin here, right? He's got the uh, he's got the generic background, right? He's a healthcare M and A and other banker in Santander, right? Um, he's got very little detail, Gavin. I'm going to be just brutal. Yeah, this. please, yeah. No, but very little detail around um, healthcare corporate banking. I mean, you know, I know in M and A you can't necessarily expand on. Uh, you know, maybe some of the deals, but you can probably talk about some of the deals that you've been involved in and what specific areas of healthcare, right? Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different spaces, right? Um, is it, is it technology? Is it insurers? Right. I mean, so, um, just provide a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of beef around that and, and put some keywords in there that are gonna, that are gonna matter. Um, Healthcare banker, I, I can't, I, I'm assuming individual contributor, I can't see management responsibilities, right? Um, you know, or title. So um, sometimes in the banking world, that's a sort of like a, a gating factor, right? MD, VP, associate, right? Um, and again here, medical imaging specialist, smaller firm, I know that from talking to you, but you know, this is where you may want to sort of like clarify what they do, right? Um, because, you know, I can click on it, I can find out a little bit more about it. Um, but because they're a smaller player, you may want to sort of like um, identify competitors, competes with or whatever, right? Um, and tie it back to, right? Healthcare banking, right? Corporate development, so it could be corporate development and M&A. So up here in healthcare banking, that's your title, right? Um, you know, you can put in, in parentheses M&A, financing, whatever, equity, IPOs, right? Um, and it ties back and it shows consistency between the two, okay? And sometimes the affinities are down here, right? Um, you know, sometimes you can see, this is where you see affinities. You can see, you know, the Irish affinity here. He's obviously went to UCC, right? Um, but, you know, this is where people will sometimes declare their affinities. So if you're looking at someone's profile, um, you can uh, you can see if they're you know maybe they're they're a member of their you know the LGBT chapter for their firm and you're gay and they've got that affinity and you want to sort of like uh, play up that right in in an outreach to them right um, so uh, you know so sort of expanding on those is sometimes good to do as well right so that's what I would say and about you can definitely expand on this here too okay perfect thank you there's one or two more in the uh, in the comments. Who've uh, volunteered? Right, let's see. Vishal, let's have a look at you. All right. Here it's SIFT. Okay. Um, right. Two and a half years of management, two and a half years in, you know, as an individual contributor. Marquetta, uh, it's a pretty built out profile. Um, I need to double check on SIFT just to um, remind myself what they do. Bear in mind, I'm looking at thousands of companies all day long, right? So sometimes this should be in the, uh, you know, at the, should be top of mind, but I can't remember what they do. Um, so 
I'll do a bit of digging. I may take a while to come up. Um, if it helps, Fiergal, it's uh, it's machine learning for online fraud prevention. Okay. Fraud in the for, fraud focused on retailers or focused on the advertisers? Uh, retailers and any firms that have sort of accounts, job, fake jobs, fake dating profiles, etc. But yes, all online, e-commerce focused. Okay. So because you're in sales, you need to sort of like you know, a explain that a little bit. You know that it's uh, you know that's fraud focused on profiles. Just like expand that out a little bit, right? Fraud as an obvious keyword. Let's see, is it? Oh, it's down here. It's in here. There, right? But what I can't see is your client orientation. Right? So I can't see who, you, who you're targeting, right? So this is where you name like either people that you're you know focused on or people that you've actually closed, right? Um, Marketa, again, smaller firm. I'm not, I'm not familiar with them, right? So, um, what's your name? Yeah. 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 People there? Um, so, you listen to your functionally consistent merchant partnerships manager. It sounds like a euphemism for a sales role. You may miss out on some on some roles because of that title, right? You've got business here, you've got account, right? So you're you're probably okay from a title perspective, right? But this one's a bit vague. What it is? Is it a is it a partnerships role or is it a direct sales role? I would just beef it out a little bit, like in terms of clarify what the firms do. And then Intel looks a little like a little bit of an anomaly here, right? Um, but then you clarify. It, it definitely that. was. Okay. Um, so I'm just like, I, I just say an anomaly in terms of industry. These two look highly consistent, right? Um, yeah, this, I, I was essentially a BDR at Marketa and then transitioned into a, uh, an AE role and then AE manager role at SIFT. Okay. But I think functionally you're pretty consistent. You need to sort of like clarify the industry a little bit more and just highlight the verticals a little bit more so it pops a bit, a bit better. Same bland background. Um, less mutual connections, not too much on the about side, side of things. I mean, the AI machine learning, you can spell that out somewhere else in case someone's using the full versions of those to, uh, to use as a keyword. Okay. So Perfect. hopefully that, do. Uh, Thank you. Hopefully that helps. But new business manager, I mean, bear in mind that doesn't necessarily mean that you are a a, uh, the title doesn't necessarily is, isn't necessarily descriptive of you as a manager. You clarify it here. Manage a team of AEs, SEs, and BDRs. You might want to clarify the number of people you manage. Oh, could you mention that one more time? I just said you might want to clarify the number of people you've managed. Yes, totally. Okay. So you've got nice tenure as a manager. And that's the another th important thing to say is that if you want to get promoted into a, like, promoted into a management role, the best place to do that is in your current company. If you're trying to do that in a move, a recruiter is not going to help you do that in the move. You have to use a friend to get to that who trusts you to move into a management role without the experience. Makes sense. Declan asked the question, uh, should you describe yourself in first person? I think so. I think it looks a little little off if you're describing yourself in a third person, you sound a little aloof. But that's a personal preference. Some of this is personal preferences, right? I have a, there's sort of pet peeves I have as well, right? And certain things that I didn't bring up, but there's uh, some articles I've written around pet peeves around, like things, simple things like uh, email addresses, right? Uh, just be careful of using a Hotmail address or, you know, an old, you know, cable or internet service provider email address, it can make you look like you're a bit old school and you're not really with the times so and you don't have a Gmail. So just be careful about doing things like that. All right. I think that's, is that good enough? If there's any other questions? Speak yeah. Forever hold your peace. Fergal, how can people contact you? So I'm at Fergal at Glenbourne.com. I'll go back to the, um, to the deck for a second. That's me, Fergal Glenbourne. At Fergal Kenny, I'm a very 
like inactive tweeter um or you can reach out to me on, on on the website or find me on linkedin and then just digital irish if you've got any questions for digital irish um we actually have an event coming up on tuesday which we're uh which we'll probably sort of announce and send out today um so if you want to join us for that we're going to be playing around with breakout rooms again on tuesday i think it's at seven o'clock um or are we doing one o'clock what are we doing Tom? you know i'm, I'm not sure <laughs> one o'clock or seven o'clock we may be trying to factor into kind of yeah. <laughs> uk folks joining us as well um but um and if you want to sign up for our mailer list, you can go to digitalirish.com and, uh, and add your name to, to the emails. And that way you'll get to find out about uh, events that are coming up. Okay. So hopefully that was useful. If you follow me on, um, on LinkedIn or you'll, you'll, you'll see, I'll, I'll post this on LinkedIn, right? Um, I'll post the, the link to record to the recording and I'll post the, um, the deck as well. Okay. So thanks for your time. And uh, hope to see some of you on Tuesday. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, Virgil. Thanks, guys. Thank bye, Virgil. Very good. Thanks, guys. Bye.